we're going to get going again. Uh, we just took a pause uh, for a moment, so I appreciate everybody's indulgence here. So, uh, Mandy, are we back on record? Or are we on record? Um, so we're on record with uh, Mr. Andrew Halsho, he's the Executive Director of the Anchorage Community Development Authority. Mr. Halsho, thank you for coming to me. I know you're busy, man, and I know we have some people here also. I didn't want to take up a lot of your time, but this is something that was on our agenda in the past, and uh, with, I know you've been at the home on the, on the job. Is there some information that you have that you can help us to explain this here? Uh, well, when, when I got the request to you know, appear before the committee, uh, it was very timely. Uh, uh, I started on July 27th, and uh, you know, in my conversations with Mayor Berkowitz, he was very clear that he wanted us to be innovative and bold uh, with the transit center to address a decades-old problem. Uh, and so what I've done in the last three months is pretty much spent a good portion of my time at the transit center. Uh, we've not only gone in and surveyed uh, the clients there, but the tenants we have continually reviewed hours and hours of surveillance footage. Uh, we talked to stakeholders. Uh, and I just want to start by bringing the committee up to date on our year-to-date public safety uh, statistics. These are through the first 10 months of October. As you can see, through the first 10 months of October, we have, re we have re removed 4,600 transients uh, for breaking code of conduct. Center. Yes, all. Thank you. If my name is Chairman, I, I, you said first 10 months of October. Uh, first 10 months uh, through October. Through October. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Apologies. Thank you. That's okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, we have called APD and AFD 460 times, uh, which you'll remember at the height of the Inland Inn, I think they had 490 calls. So the calls haven't gone away, they've just moved across the street. We confiscated almost 800 alcohol containers. Uh, and we've called the Community Service Patrol 1,550 times. Now, bear in mind, these are individual calls, and by the time ASP shows up, there might be two or three inebriates that we have held in security. What this represents is 90% of what our security does every day. And we average 25 engagements a day uh, with, these four with one of, of these four categories. So as you can see, uh, these numbers are up over the last six months of last year. We are averaging about 18 and a half engagements per day. So as you can see, the problem is getting worse. Uh, the next three uh, pictures are uh, kind of highlight our point. The first one was pulled from a uh, security video uh, I reviewed. This was on the 8th of November. I watched four hours, actually eight hours of video, four from two different cameras in the end, opposite end to get a, a feel for the flow. Uh, uh, the gentleman in the green jacket, um, to give you an idea, for four hours, he was at the transit center. Uh, he would hang out around the tables or by the stairwell. Somebody would come in and they'd say a couple of words to him and they'd go out the back door. And then a couple of minutes later, he'd come right back in. Uh, and there was one segment where he came into the transit center, our security started to follow him. He went out one exit and in another camera, you can see like 25 seconds later, he came in. So the bottom line is, this is really the cat and mouse game. Uh, the next picture you'll see, we were at the transit center two days later. You can see to the far right, same gentleman. The third picture was taken just Monday uh, with a handheld cell phone camera, and there's our friend. Uh, he's not the only one. Uh, there's a handful of, 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 I'd say, regular inhabitants um, where you can watch the video surveillance, um, although we have no uh, proof. Uh, certainly the patterns uh, in law enforcement would say the patterns certainly uh, fit the prototype behavior. So over the last three months we realized that you know, we need to take a new approach. Um, we've taken some short-term uh, steps. I'm not going to get into them uh, in, in detail. Uh, the mayor is going to have a press conference at the transit center next week to unveil some changes. Uh, but as you can see, we, we've taken some new and innovative set steps. Uh, we're in the process of taking over uh, the 45 cameras that people more have. Uh, part of the problem is historically we have access to only two or three cameras in the building. Um, I, I guess a couple of years ago, people more received a federal transportation grant to put in cameras. So they have access to the feed. We don't have access to the feed. And first thing I noticed was, well, that doesn't make any sense because 
we have a dispatch, we have uh, security monitoring stations, we monitor four garages in town, uh, we monitor those full time. So it just seems you know, really you know, conducive that we should take over the monitoring so we can monitor the transit center in real time uh, and we don't have to go back. Uh, for instance, when an incident happens, normally what we have to do is we have to go to the, the, the transit public to people over and say, can we get the video between noon and five on this day or that day? So it's not real time and it doesn't allow us to react. Uh, there was an incident at the uh, JC Penny garage last month. Um, within an hour, uh, within a half an hour, we had the video APD and within 45 minutes they had a suspect in custody. So that's what we need to do. We need to be converting on those right then and there. Uh, we can't let it get stale. So we had a couple of questions. <coughs> sure. Ms. Well, a question and a comment. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Andrew. So what are the new hours? Uh, the new hours we're closing. We're opening an hour early, or we're, we're opening an hour <coughs> later and closing an hour earlier tonight. Uh, so we're open from six. We normally open at five. We're open from six to nine. Now during the weeks, okay. uh, during the weekends, uh, I believe it's nine to five. Okay. Thank five. you. Thank you, Mr. And if I can follow, Mr. Yes, Chairman. Um, earlier this year, I think in February, you may already know this. Um, we, Chairman Train and I, were approached by the Transit Advisory Board um, Chairman about these issues. And we sat in that conference room over there and, and had an extensive meeting with former ACDA staff um, and the Transit Advisory Commission's uh, Chairman Board. And I gotta tell you, I'm so impressed and pleased that things are finally happening. You know, this makes me feel really, really good. And so I just appreciate hearing the news that we really well, um, you, Mr. Chairman. Through, through the chair, uh, Assemblyman Jackson, I don't have to tell the four of you how long this has been a huge job. And you know, coming into this job, you know, when you look at uh, what this is, this is obviously one of the four garages in our portfolio. Um, this should really be our flagship. You know, its location is on Main Street. Um, this building has a lot of potential, uh, but it suffers from from really one big glare and weakness and that is, it's a public space. I mean, it's a public space, people have the right to be there, there's no law against loitering. Um, so when you watch videos and you spend as much time as I have down there, you know, you, you, our security guards are really handcuffed. I mean, they can't ask people to move on, you know, even though you know people are there for no good reason whatsoever, you, know, you have no legal authority to, to, you know, to ask, hey, what's in the backpack, or, you know, move along, people are there. Uh, it's a shame because you have a, a, a good number of them that are there, that are just there to catch a bus, want to mind their own business, get on the bus, and be left alone. Uh, but it's become a very unfriendly place, or place. And when you go back through all the media stories, whether it's television or, or print, you know, they interview people that say the same thing. I don't like to go. I need to catch the bus, but I don't like to go. Uh, this is our asset. We are the landlord. We own this building. It's a $24 million facility that we pay property taxes on. A lot of people don't realize that ACDA, not only do we pay property taxes, but we pay a percentage of our gross, not net revenue. Um, we pay over at the city over a half a million dollars a year in property taxes and fees. Um, but this is our building, um, and we're responsible for it, and I think it's time we claim responsibility for it and make some fundamental changes. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Train, a question. Mr. Elko, I appreciate your enthusiasm for this transit center. Last administration wanted to get rid of it, shut it down, and move it to Midtown. That wasn't happening. I know they wanted to put it next to Cuddy Park. It wasn't going to happen. So I appreciate your commitment to make sure this is corrected, the problems we've got here. Because as Zoe was telling you, we've been looking at this for a long time. We know what the problems are, as you do. And let us know how we can help you with it. Well, I think, um, it, it, you know, I'll get to it because we've come to, you know, pretty much final conclusion from this building. Uh, but again, back to the short term, we've made some cosmetics and structural uh, changes. Uh, by Christmas, the exterior benches will be replaced. We've not only limited the hours of the transit center itself, but we've limited the hours of the bathroom. I mean, the bathroom's now with a nine to five, uh, Monday through Sunday. Uh, and I will tell you, every Monday morning we have a staff meeting, and we get a briefing from our security personnel and our janitorial personnel. <coughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you would just be absolutely floored with what goes on in those bathrooms. 
Uh, and it is scary because every week you, you just simply don't think it get worse and then the next week it gets worse. So we've had, we felt compelled to limit the hours just simply for public health and safety. You know, the building in and of itself is not structurally designed for public place. I mean, it violates several commandments of the public space. The bathrooms are isolated, they're in the back hallways, which you know, it leaves you no room to, 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 to keep an eye on them. You know, the way the, the, the facility is structured, everything from not just the bathrooms uh, in the stairwell in the middle of the complex, but everything down to the tile pool, the grout, because we spend an arm and a leg maintaining it. Um, so we've limited the hours of the bathroom. Um, one of the things I do, I really want to express great appreciation <coughs> for this is Jody, the, trans, the new transit director. Uh, we have brought them in early to the process. Uh, we have created monthly meetings where we sit down with them every month to talk about what's going on in the transit center. We've opened dialogues that have never been opened before. Uh, we feel, uh, as assembly member training said, we have a chance of moving the transit center in the next five to ten years from what we understand is between zero and negative 0.5%. <laughs> so that's the hub. So <laughs> you know, look, I mean, honestly, downtown is always going to need a transportation hub. It, it, it's essential. Uh, and the bottom line is, is we have to embrace transit as a partner, not a tenant, but they're a partner. Uh, and we feel like moving forward that both of us can work together uh, and create a space that's safe um, and is modern uh, and meets the needs of, of transit. So we've also um, engaged, uh, and again, these will be rolled out next week by the mayor, we've engaged some, some other cosmetic and structural uh, improvements to the, um, to the center. But this is really a short term. I mean, you know, the problem with the building is it's a 30-year-old <coughs> building that's really outlived its useful life. Um, for the first time, I asked my finance people to drill down to the numbers because we have a wide portfolio when you look at our finances, um, we kind of group everything together. So I asked them to isolate the transit center and look at the transit center as far as income and expenses. Uh, and currently we are losing almost $30,000 a month on that building. Seriously. And that's, that's because- That's the parking garage <coughs> the transit? Not the parking garage, just, the, just the, 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 the transit. Well, when you factor in the, even the parking garage, right? Uh, and so you know, we're caught in this kind of economic death spiral, uh, an unfriendly, place, um, a square footage rate, a blended square footage rate among our tenants that is far below market expense. Um, and on the other side, our expenses are going up. This year, uh, ACDO expect to, expects to spend almost a million dollars just on security and janitorial. I mean, a million dollars. Uh, a, lot of these, a lot of these expenses and a lot of these costs are being driven simply because the problem with the center being a public place uh, is, is, is causes endless problems. Um, I mean, I don't have to tell the fire chief, who's chief this year, um, you know, I don't have to tell them. I mean, I've been over there several times during the day and watched, you know, this vice attacks on the sidewalk and watched, you know, we got four or five uh, AFD, you have two APD. I mean, we all know that's a significant amount of resources that can be utilized far better. So we feel not just from a community public health and safety uh, and from a, 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 an economic standpoint, but also we feel like if we uh, take a very innovative and bold approach, as the mayor has told us to, to the transit center, that city block can be transformed and it can also open up other development op op options. As you know, Mark Pepper owns a lot across the street. He's been talking about building the Augustine Tower but every anchor tenant he's talked to has drawn a line in the sand with the transit center. I mean, they don't want to sign a lease when they look across the street at what's there now. Um, so, if you let me uh, pass this hand out. If, if I might, sure. uh, while you take a break on that, I, uh, I have one general comment and then I'd like you to continue, please. And that is, um, I apologize, Ms. Gray Jackson had a meeting at one thirty. she had to go to, so she apologizes and I'll save her information. The Chiefs. And uh, <coughs> the is, you know, public transit 
isn't just for those who can't afford or doesn't do, don't uh, have the funding to drive. Um, quite frankly, public transit should be driving some of our economy and getting your employees to work. Some people that would prefer not to have that added expense or even the, the hassle of driving, particularly in the downtown area. And most of the major cities I've been to, Washington, D.C., Chicago, Philadelphia, have used their public transit and have actually been fairly impressed. They move far greater numbers of people and, quite frankly, do it fairly fast <laughs> in, in the succession turnaround. And I'm not to say that every one of their public facilities or transit centers are not welcoming places because they or don't have their own issues because they do. But you're absolutely right. I mean, this is a, this is a public space, place and space and, you know, I'm going to go back to it a little bit and then also like look, projecting forward the innovation. I, I like where you're headed. And one of the things we might look back at, Chief, and something on the, on the agenda moving forward is as the staffing goes up, you know, we used to have a foot patrol in the downtown area before the transit center became a very big location. We have often had location problems with it uh, that came with it, but it seemed to be far less because we have routine and random police presence also back and bolstering, if you will, the security. So that's something that I think that really needs to be looked at. Um, at one time, we did have a substation. It was in the back room, I think, if to the thing might remember. I think there was even a DUI processing station there at one point. Um, again, kind of an awkward place. And <clears throat> somewhat, you could pull into the back alley and get somebody in and out, but you were sometimes unseen. And that's not necessarily the thing either. You want presence, visible, pre visible presence. So I appreciate, I look forward to the press conference and certainly look forward to the innovation of what to do with and again, you know, it really gets back to the layout of the building. Um, if, if, you, if you remember, in the far west end, there's kind of this jagged nook that goes back and then out for, uh, for the other west side exit near the elevators. Um, and that really is our hot spot. I mean, you know, it, and it's amazing how sophisticated these people are. They know where the blind spots are. I mean, they know how to duck into the bushes and do their deals. Um, and we've got 50 cameras there, I could add 50 more. And it's not simply not going to address the long-term problems of the transit center. And uh, if I could, Mr. Yes. Chair, just really go through these real quick. Uh, yeah, we laid out really a case for major change. We've got increasing costs of risk due to public space requirements. Uh, we have public health and safety concerns throughout the property. Uh, it's an age facility, it's 30 years old, it's outlived its useful life. Uh, the band-aids that we're doing are getting more and more expensive. I'm sitting on a $60,000 estimate to fix those flat roofs, which never should have been built to begin with. Uh, and it has, more importantly, uh, it has a negative community perception. Uh, and I think you have, as you said, uh, you have a public transportation system that could be fortified if people knew that when they got off the bus downtown, they were getting into a clean, safe environment. Uh, we think there's an opportunity uh, to create the most significant change downtown since the Fifth Avenue Mall was built. Uh, we think that uh, with a privatized footprint, with a redesign of the building, it will equal better security uh, and uh, tenant protection. Um, we think a, a redesigned custom space would allow us to attract uh, a different suite of tenants. Um, I would go back to the, the report done by a UAA professor a couple of years ago on the structure uh, where it was her comments that, you know, basically the transit center was turned into kind of a de facto social service. Uh, and we have had conversations, we're studying transit centers all over the world, uh, from Helsinki to, to Charlotte, uh, and, you know, many communities, including Spokane, have had similar problems we have. Uh, and what they've done, we're trying to learn from their best practices as far as design, uh, security, and uh, operations. And so, you know, there's some good best practices out there that we're looking at for the first time. You know, we think that transform the, we think we can transform that entire city block. As I said, we think it opens up the adjacent parcels for development, which is going to boost the, uh, the tax base, broaden the tax base. Uh, we think uh, a new and improved transit center will uh, increase the property value of the, of the property, which puts more money into the city's pockets and broadens the tax base for tax base, which is that. And we think we can draw a different demographic to the transit center. Uh, we really believe there's three key arguments to taking a drastic approach to the transit center. It's an aged facility, as I said. Uh, it's costing way too much given the current condition and, and operation maintenance of transit. Uh, we think we can provide uh, the 
positive economic return, not just to ACBA, but to taxpayers uh, by creating a, a, a modern downtown space uh, and a modern uh, transportation hub. Uh, and we think more importantly, you know, we all know there's been decades of public health and safety problems at that, at that, at that property. Uh, you know, I grew up, uh, my first job in the family business was washing cars at our office the corner of Bidman B, which is still there. Matter of fact, it's about 60 yards from where my desk sits now. Um, and you know, I mean, that was 1980. And you know, noon on Saturday, washing cars, there was prostitutes walking by. You know, that was the height of the pipeline. Um, and it was a crazy place. Um, and when I go into the transit center, it reminds me a lot of Fourth Avenue in the 80s. Um, and you know, Good, bad, or indifferent, that's the way it is. But we have a responsibility and an opportunity to change this. And we find that you know, we have a mayor who's aligned, uh, who's, who's given us clear direction. Like I said, he wants us to be innovative and bold um, and fix the transit center. And we think we, we, you know, we, we, we are on the verge of coming up with uh, a plan. Uh, the mayor is going to announce some changes next Tuesday. The following week is our December board meeting. Uh, we're going to present uh, some conceptual <coughs> plans to our board um, and ask them to allow us to go to, to, to the next phase uh, to really take a look at, at, at really, I mean, what we're called, we're gonna, we need to shut and gut. That's what we need to do. Um, and we, we've really worked with transit again. Um, you know, we're looking at all financing tools and options out there. Uh, for the last six years, our organization has been stymied and even looking at what our own capabilities are. I mean, ACDA has bonding authority. We've never used it. Um, we've never, the organization was never even allowed to kind of go out and get a legal opinion as far as what kind of tax treatments we could offer, what kind of bonding capacity. Um, this past week, we've lent two RFPs to two different legal firms to give us that information. So by January, when we start, hopefully in phase two of this process, we'll know exactly what kind of burden ACDA can carry, what kind of debt limit, uh, what we can afford, and then we'll afford from the budget. But we think the timing is right, and uh, we think the community not just deserves this, but you know our first responders. I mean, you know, God knows, especially the last 90 days, um, both AP and AFD have, have just have been inundated with the spice issue. Um, but it's not just them. I mean, the, the community service patrol, like you said, you know, 1,550 times through the first 10 months of this year, they've been at our doorstep. And it takes time and effort. We have protocol. Uh, when, when we have an inebriate on the process, uh, on the problem, as a matter of fact, uh, here's a perfect example when I was watching the video, um, watching the, the security surveillance. You can see a gentleman walks in from outside, you know, totally normal, doesn't look like, you know, doesn't even look like he's carrying anything. Sits down on the bench, within five minutes he's slumped over. About 10 minutes later, you know, we have to have three guys, three security guards approach him. I mean, there's a there's a very strict protocol. Put on gloves, there's only so, so how, how you touch the person, how you try and wake them, you know, bring them up. So you can see on the video, they stand him up. He's got an alcohol container that you certainly couldn't see when he walked into them. So they confiscate that, they usher him into the security office, and they sit there and wait for the guy uh, until ASP, the community service. And what that does is that takes security officers off the beat to patrol our other three properties. Um, and you know, we don't see the problem getting any better. I mean, we see it getting worse week after week, um, and especially during the winter. In the summer, you can see our numbers dip down. A lot of folks are outside. But boy, in the winter, you know, you start to see the spikes in between October and March. It's pretty dramatic. So, you know, we think that, you know, we think something needs to be done, and we know that we can do something about it. I'd like to add to Mr. Trainer. <coughs> Chopper, does C CSP come into your building to get these people? Yeah. Because we had a problem here, because if they can't use your restroom, they use ours. And CSP would not come in and pick up our people. They said we'd have to drag them out to the sidewalk. We address them. We're going to be. And I know what you mean about what's in there. This gentleman took all his clothes off and used his waist to cover the walls. Yeah. I mean, we and had that happen every week. Um, uh, three weeks ago during our janitorial briefing, um, the, uh, the manager of the janitorial company told us 
a story about how one of his workers was approached when they were cleaning the bathroom by a young lady who offered him sex for $5. Uh, I mean, this is not uncommon. And you know, you go back through through the last few years, I mean, I know KTUU did a story on sex trafficking, a lot of the, a lot of you know young people are preyed upon at the transit center, they're homeless. You know, I mean you can see it. You, you know, watching the, the security footage for hours on end so you get a consistent feel for the flow, you can see, or at least you have a pretty good impression of what's going on. Uh, <coughs> and you know, I mean, the transit center doesn't create these problems, we're just simply the host to those problems. And uh, as the landlord, I mean, I feel it's our responsibility to propose solutions to address this. Um, and certainly the mayor feels the same way. And as I said, next week I'm going to gather at a board meeting. Um, you're going to start to see some, some more specific ideas about how we move forward and make, I would say, the most dramatic changes to that building in the history of, of that building. Thank you, Chopper. Mr. Steele. Uh, cleaning, cleaning the stairwell, was, I, I used to get the bus and just clean that if the bathrooms were locked up, and she was just um, and, and it's, this is the third time we've had this issue. Uh, and it's it's a city center. I mean, you know, it's the middle of town here. What kind of, uh, you know, visitors, uh, what, what kind of impression do you have? And you're right about development. You've got that group, but you've also got the investment. And so what we're doing now is we're, we're reviewing best practices of transit centers all over the world. Um, we're talking to downtown stakeholders. Um, I know the firm uh, that's the architectural firm that's, that's, uh, that we've retained is, is actually met with the CAP team, uh, met with AMP, uh, met with other organizations. So before they even put pencil to paper, they are trying to understand the facility um, and actually suggest changes that address the problems and don't just ask them. And we think that you know one of the good things, one of the one of our primary objectives is to create to to, to move to move the transit folks to the far west side of the building, um, you know, redesign the space, give them a very modern. Uh, give them a, a very modern public transportation space with administration space, um, very limited seating, you know, not a lot of public space, but facilities outside. Uh, and we think, in conjunction with transit, I mean, they also believe that that would help them. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, transit is our highest rent pay, and you know, a, a renovation of this dramatic nature will actually save the city money, because currently people move our shares. A percentage of the cost of both security and, and janitorial. So when you reduce that footprint, you reduce the cost, uh, and we all know that public transit, especially in the coming years, their budget's going to be under tight scrutiny. Um, and we feel like, you know, doing this, proposing dramatic changes really benefits all. Benefits taxpayers, it's going to benefit the city by helping uh, people move around and, and restrain their, you know, contain their budgets. Uh, yeah, I mean, it just, it, 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 there's, any way you look at it, there's just no, there's no cause to this. Thank you, Mr. Chaco, appreciate it. One more question. Uh, structurally, um, I know you guys looked at it in terms of, uh, you know, you're doing some upgrades to it, but um, what about structurally? Is it this 30-year-old building going to last? Uh, no, it's not. Or can it be upgraded? Yeah, I mean, um, like I said, I mean, our initial, our initial feeling is you have to shut it and go. I mean, you know, you you have to get in. As I said, it's thirty-year built boiler system, HVAC, all that needs to be replaced. The roofs with the flat awnings over the entrances. I mean, you know, the, the, those are just the maintenance costs are getting out of hand. And when you factor in, we're already losing thirty thousand dollars a month at that building. It's just it's it's, it's crazy. Uh, Mr. Trang had a gun. It's kind of like our old stainless steel shingles we had over at the Furman Arts Center. When the right mind would put stainless steel shingles on that, we found them all over downtown. Remember that time? <laughs> I got a question for Cher. Cher, you're normally here every morning. You run the bus in from the valley. What do you see over there at the transit center? Um, exactly what Andrew was talking about. It's um, a little bit less in the morning when I come in because, you know, people are just trying to stay in there and be cool because it's 
I mean, be warm, I should say, especially because they can't just, especially this time of year. And they're, um, yeah, definitely, they were really sad to have those tables go. That was just a really bad thing because there was a lot of people hanging out, you know, and tables were a mess. Um, the bathrooms, and, you know, just starting when I started, I didn't think anything about the bathrooms being bad. And actually, they really aren't at that time in the morning. Now, when I go to catch the afternoon bus home, that's a little bit of a different <laughs> environment. But there's also um, people that ride in on the bus with me that come across here, and they, you know, feel the same way I do as coming through to get through the um, building over here and what they see. And there's been some days or there's been some really awful things to see, just being in the wrong place at the wrong time. But um, there's also people that I work with that come in from the valley. I don't work with them, so I, I ride in with, and they come in from the valley and they go through to the transit, or not the uh, transit, it's the probation. It's the people that wear the ankle bracelets. The Department of Corrections. Yes, and they go in the back door, of course. But um, their uh, smoking break is in, you know, like when I go to catch the bus, it's in the back in the um, place back there, and they do the same thing. There's always something, yeah, it's, it's not. Everywhere you look, you, you know, there's just suspicious behavior. Um, yeah. and, and I think you look at it and you think, okay, that's just simply not right. Um, I think for, for And God forbid they were going to change that job by letting us get dropped off right across from there because there's a lot of people that walk, you know, different places that aren't as far from there. And if they don't stop there, it would not be a good deal for a lot of us from the valley. Thank you. I just wanted Sarah to give us her impression. She rides it almost every day <laughs> from the valley every night home. Well, and, and Sherry, there, there's a reason the bathrooms are clean in the morning because our janitorial crew you know, scrubs at night. So when the doors open, right. you know, when, <laughs> you, get the, you, well, you get the best. I mean, well, yeah, <laughs> you get the worst from there. And in the afternoon, like I said, it's, you know, it's, it's worse too. But it's also, there's things that, you know, there's I can um, just, it's like our bathroom here in City Hall too. You know, nobody goes, nobody that works here every day goes to the bathroom on the first floor. You go upstairs to the bathroom. <clears throat> But the thing with the um, thing with the transit, or, um, yeah, with the transit is that there are still um, places that people just don't think about if they don't if they don't go in there, and it's one place that, like I said, a lot of people do. And, and we think uh, the short term uh, improvements will help. Uh, by December, as I said, we're going to replace the benches so people can't lean back. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it's just, um, we were there yesterday, and, you know, you walk through the facility, and you walk outside on the sidewalk, and you've got people crowding around that aren't there to catch a bus that are smoking, uh, and, you know, I don't want to be gross, but this is the reality of the center. Uh, you know, we walk past one of our maintenance guys shoveling frozen vomit off the sidewalk. I mean, you know, I, I mean, that's... That's what you deal with. I took a video as we were walking by, it wasn't a week or so ago, and mm -hmm. there were two spots in between the little uh, art that's on the sidewalk. Yeah. Uh, uh, so that's a good thing. Lieutenant <laughs> 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 Dillon, I, I know the chief had to go with uh, Just in, in the interim, is there something that, that the department is either looking at or can discuss trying to bolster what, what's already being taken on? I mean, you know, I think you've heard, we all know there's complexities with you know, whether someone's committing a crime or not or suspected of committing a crime or not. There's these like the videos where, I, I can tell you, I have checked the video system over there uh, when they first installed it with uh, the bus combination folks. And that stuff is pretty high zoo. Uh, at least three or four years back when they put it in, it was uh, like, it looked like a smoke detector uh, that, that, that has a fisheye kind of view, but they, it, when, they, when they go to view it, it actually flattens out and you can actually see quite a bit and hear quite a bit. So uh, that, that's something that I think you know, <coughs> can be discounted if there's somebody out there trying to make deals. I mean, you can, 
might take a little bit of listening, but somebody might be able to find these people. Uh, much like the spreading of selling of spice right now, maybe there's people down there that are pushing drugs or something that might be caught through. You know, if you work the vice unit, maybe there's cap team vice units and special teams that could. Right now, we don't have foot patrol. I get that, and right. the staffing is, is some priority that maybe we could look at. Yep, uh, we we have been looking at that, and, and when staffing allows their foot patrol, I know is trying to get some. They actually are right. trying to put some people out on foot, so that is something. Certainly, we know that. I think we still have access to it's web based, correct? Your cameras and whatnot. And so, we were talking about that very yesterday. We're, we're using that as part of our investigations to deal with the spice issues and whatnot, too. So, and, and we have, we're you know, designing a system, our eyes here, trying to design the system, the existing system we have now, so you can access the cameras on an iPad or an iPhone. So, you know, law enforcement, you know, wants to take a look at what's going on, you know, we give them access in, you know, an access code and they can basically see, you know, through an iPad or a, a phone, you know, a smartphone, what's going on, have access to our cameras. Uh, and we think, you know, we, we have to embrace technology more, but honestly, Mr. Chair, technology is only going to get you so far without some real structural changes to the property. Well, we, I, I thank you for your time and commitment here. Is there any questions from the Committee. Trent? Yes, sir. Thank you so much for the update. Um, this has been on our agenda prior, as Ms. Gray Jackson alluded to, myself as Trent, Ms. Gray Jackson said with uh, prior members of the ACDA and the public tra uh, transit and uh, uh, UPAC, if you will. And we talked about some things. I'm glad to see in the video, actually, the code of conduct that's posted. It wasn't always so, and I like that because the picture here just illustrates how blatantly obvious it is about the code of conduct as it goes through so uh, that's one of the things that just as a tip just to make sure your people know that as long as people are aware of what the code of conduct is you can actually 86 them for that and you, and you so show that in your statistics the removal uh, the 4600 I think that's a good starting point that continuously is just make sure that we just a just a you know personal story about uh, I think it was quite a month ago I was there one afternoon at the supervisor and our community outreach person. Um, and a gentleman came up to me. <coughs> and he was, he was an angry, he was a nice fellow. Uh, his name was Robert, he's from Bell, told me a story. Uh, then I asked you after a long, at first he asked me to buy him a bus pass. And I thought, okay, before I buy you a bus pass, I'm gonna have you tell me your story because I wanna know, you know who you are and what goes on. And so, nice guy, you know, we talked for about 10 or 15 minutes and I bought him a bus pass. Well, I'm there a couple of days later and he obviously doesn't recognize that he's already asked me for a bus pass and he comes up and we go through the same thing, right? Um, and I said, look, Robert, you know, I bought you a bus pass last week. I'm not gonna do it again. You're, you're heavily intoxicated. I'm not gonna put you on a bus with a bus driver. Um, and so, and, and, and please, you know, do me a favor. Stop and, and stop asking people in the transit center. Uh, and he kind of got a little irate because, oh, we get away with anything here. And you know, I didn't have a response because he's absolutely right. I mean, you know, I was like, okay. You know. But walking out the doors, I thought, you know, not for very much money. Yeah, that's I mean, good. I, you know, two words always pop into my head every time I walk through those doors, and that's enough for me. Andrew, can I ask you something? Would you, um, I think, probably, you know, we have a lot of those people come over and take the bus home with us. They get on the transit and they get the, you know, the seven dollars it costs to go to the valley. The valley movie. And, um, and the valley, yeah, <laughs> no, the, the valley movie, yes. And so there's a lot of them that ride home, and they are, like you said, a little intoxicated. Um, and there are some of the times that they've been to that we just had to say, or we, I say, the bus driver has to say, no, we can't take you. But there are a lot of times, too, that they, they go to the valley. Thanks. Well, we, we had um, we have our officers uh, go have to go on board buses at the transit center and pull people off, mm -hmm. uh, and we stopped for a while. We stopped during the summer because you know, we were worried about liability, and so we got a legal opinion from uh, the city attorney that said, "No, you have the right, uh, you have the ability to go on the buses." So you know, our guys, if a bus driver calls and people who will call our dispatch and say, "Look, we have a, have a problem." Our guys will go on the bus. Ninety percent of the time, you know, our guys will go on and say, "Okay, sir, you know, you need to get off the bus," and they do it. You know, ten percent of the time, 
we end up calling APD because you know my guys are told, look, any problem, back off, and you call public safety because you know you're not police officers. Um, but you know we have the uh, I mean the collaboration again. I can't say enough about the collaboration between ACD and the transit. I mean we're sharing lists of those who are banned from the property and transferring that list to ban those people from the buses. Uh, I mean we're really starting to share data that has never been shared before to try and you know hone in on uh, you know the problem riders because you know it's not just a, a safety issue for us and people in the transit centers. I mean, it's becoming a real safety problem for bus drivers. And you know, nobody wants that because you know, people like you know, share that just want to get on the bus, pay their fare, want to get home, want to have a safe, orderly, quiet ride. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's what they want to do. And the challenge is, is that you talk to people who are in, you know, these folks get on the bus, they seem fine, sit in a seat, and 10 minutes later, boom, you know, it hits them and they start getting unruly. Uh, and so we're really trying to crack down on that as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Appreciate it. Okay, so um, I know it looks like Lynette Marino Hines is here. Uh, we had earlier, uh, I'll just reopen it just for a minute in case there's some audience participation. Did you have something you wanted to address? Um, is it the audience participation? Yes, it is. We actually did it just in advance. We're waiting for Mr. Alco, but go ahead. We'll, we'll offer you the opportunity to share with Thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry for coming in so late. But we're, we're taping, so just make sure they know who okay. you are. And my name is Lynette Marino Hines, and I was able to come to the assembly meeting and testify uh, with a little group of, of my friends and family about the spice use. And personally, my son had passed away um, from spice. And so it was a very, you know, um, emotional testimony. And um, But I'd like to say thank you to the assembly and to um, the mayor for for increasing the penalties and the fines for the spice, but mainly for the dealers, not for the users, because I, I understand, you know, that it's the dealers we're really trying to get rid of. Um, <clears throat> and also, um, what I was, uh, what I forgot to say was that um, I know there's been a lot of work on it, and I appreciate everybody's involvement because it, it when it comes to drugs and alcohol. It's really hard to, uh, you know, to combat the social ills of the society, and so I just think that the native corporations and the tribal organizations should really step up when they can and as soon as possible, and then also, uh, you know, if the Catholic social services could get involved into rehabilitation or, or uh, we could get some kind of grants directed our way as a city. That would be really helpful for the people that that go through different, uh, you know, tragedies in their lives and life experiences. Um, but also, I just had one other uh, comment. The this is totally different. But over there by Napa on Dowling, right behind the alley there, that alleyway, uh, there is some kind of a trash service pickup. Yes. And they don't put a tarp, uh, any kind of a tarp around their fencing. They got big fencing, but all when the wind blows, it blows right over that alley. I don't know if you had complaints from Napa or any of the businesses around there, but it gets pretty bad. And they don't clean it up. They they have no worries about cleaning it up. So I just like to know if somebody can check it out because it's, it gets pretty trashy back there. Thank you. I'll check. Mr. Train said he'll commit to it. Lynette, I, I didn't get a chance to leave the assembly dais there to talk to you before you left. I know you and your family or friends were there. But I'm very sorry about the loss of your son. I know I'd said that some time yeah, ago. Thank you. But I want to thank you for taking, you know, sometimes it's things that move you to action. And I'm glad to see you at the assembly uh, trying to help us move to act to try to uh, do something about the problem with spice. And I join you. I think Mr. Halko said it best. Uh, maybe in my lifetime, maybe, uh, I'd like to think, you know, enough already with all the abuse of the substances that we're seeing. I'm really concerned with our communities taking this direction on, as a state with this marijuana. It's still a, a work in progress. We don't know what that's going to bring to our community. I can't see anything positive of it. People want to say, well, maybe you can tax it, make some revenue dollars off it. I think we're going to be, and that's some game there, I think we're going to be uh, spending more than it's getting um, in trying to keep keep up with it. That's just my own personal perspective. But thank you so much for being here today and thanks for bringing your family and testifying. On this thank you.
If there's nothing else, I think we've covered everything on the agenda. Am I just missing anything? We're done. Okay, well, let's see what time is it. And we've got uh, 1.46 p.m. and we'll be uh, including the journey meeting. Thank you.